there is a way to run a giant deep seek 671 billion parameter model without having to go buy $400,000 servers? And what if you could run other traditional server workloads alongside these giant AI models? That is the topic of today's video, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. Today, we are gonna take a giant server that is also running virtualization workloads, and we're gonna show you how you can run giant AI models alongside them. And the reason for this is really simple. There are so many folks out there that have underutilized virtualization servers. These things are running at 10, 15, 20, 30% utilization, nowhere near like a 70 or 80%. And if you're running virtualization servers that have a relatively low utilization rate, you might be able to go run giant AI models alongside the virtual machines that are already running. Now, I do wanna point out that we are using a modern server and AMD sent us a server. They also sent us chips. We have to say that this is being sponsored by AMD. We also used systems from Supermicro and HPE, so I guess they're supporting this as well. Now, of course, the performance of this is gonna be nowhere near what you would get on a giant $400,000 server. I mean, that's just kind of not what we're going for here. Instead, this is if you have a server, a large virtualization server, and you're trying to run AI models because maybe you have some extra capacity, uh, this is really the guide for that. With that, let me set the stage on how we even started on this idea, and then we're gonna get into how you set it up. And then finally, we're gonna show you some of the performance and some of the things that you can do to bias performance in one way versus another. And also some things to definitely avoid if you're gonna go down this route. And I think the key lessons learned here are gonna be super important as well. Okay, so how do we even get here? We've been running a number of different systems from small mini PC systems all the way up to large servers. And something that I've just been curious about is what would happen if we started running larger AI models on all these different CPU platforms? The idea for this really is just how many times do you have systems that you just walk away from or they just hit periods where they're just underutilized by a significant amount? And of course, that ranges all the way from mini PCs all the way up to large servers. Or another way to look at it is if you have a system that you've paid for and it's sitting there idle or mostly idle, then, well, it's just burning cash, right? Because it's depreciating and it's not doing anything useful. And so what if you could instead task these systems while you walk away and have them go and do something useful? Now, we've already talked a little bit about this on mini PCs. Performance may not be great, but of course, you can run some fairly large models, especially when you can get up to 128 gigabytes of memory. But but on servers, of course, you get a lot more memory than that. Now, we've already covered in previous pieces that you can always check out Intel AMX and how Intel is working on those. But what I really wanted to do today is take the other side that we haven't covered yet, which is the AMD side. And the reason for that is we just looked at the different virtualization options that you have going all the way from the Epic 4000 series to the 8004 series and all the way up into the 9005 series, where you can get processors that are 192 cores each. Those have 12 memory channels of DDR5. And so I guess my thought was, why don't we just go and look at, you know, if you go get the giant CPUs, 192 cores, like if you were a cloud provider and you wanted to have a whole bunch of cores in a platform, like what would that look like if you took that and translated it into, could you run VMs plus AI models? And the reason is really simple. A lot of folks have either just Linux servers sitting out there, they may have Kubernetes nodes, they may have virtualization nodes, whatever it is, but where you have a lot of CPU and memory just available because, uh, you know, maybe you just did an upgrade project and you have extra capacity, or maybe, you know, you don't necessarily need all of the virtualization nodes that you have, and so you have a couple extra that are just kind of sitting there, or, you know, whatever the heck it is, you know, a lot of folks have extra capacity that are sitting in their clusters. And if you do, go put it out in the comments because I know folks are gonna be like, no, everybody uses everything 100%, but nobody's really, or not many people are using virtualization hosts at 100% utilization, right? That's just, that's the way the industry is. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the server that we're using for this. So if you look over here, we have the AMD Epic platform, the AMD Volcano platform that they sent when we did our AMD Epic Torrent launch piece. And this is actually kind of cool because uh, not only is it teetering here, but it also has two AMD Epic SP5 sockets. Now SP5 is their big socket. And in there we have two AMD Epic Torrent processors, the 9965. Now you'll see that we have two of them here. And I just want to point out what's going on in the server because it's not necessarily something that you'd see in every server. The first thing is that we only have 12 DIMMs per CPU, which gives us a total of 24 DIMMs. 
So each CPU has 12 DDR5 memory channels. And that's something that I know a lot of folks say automatically like, oh, DDR5, that's so slow and all that kind of stuff. So with this, you actually get over half a terabyte of theoretical memory bandwidth per socket. So it's not like a desktop where you have maybe in the tens of gigabytes per second, or maybe even like a hundred gigabytes per second. You're way over that just because you have so many memory channels. The other thing though is just kind of fun is that you'll see that this has a really cool internal liquid cooling setup. So kind of like a desktop PC, you'll see that we have our liquid cooling plates and then we have our tubes that go to our radiator. So essentially we take the heat from our CPUs, it goes up to this radiator here, and then the fans just blow air and pull air through the radiator and blow it out of the rest of the chassis, cooling all the rest of the components. So it's just something that's a little different because these are higher power CPUs. These are 500 watt TDP CPUs. But if you saw our recent virtualization piece, Things like this are number one, way faster per core than previous generations. And number two, you can get like over 10 times as many cores as a lot of the servers that are out and deployed today um, in a single socket now. So from a virtualization standpoint, I think this is something that a lot of folks will find really attractive. Okay, so let's talk about how you would even get started with this. Now guys, I know that there are plenty of folks that are extraordinarily advanced in this. I know there are also a lot of folks that have never tried anything like this. So let's make it really easy for folks to follow along. The first step I would say is to go to open WebUI's GitHub page because there, there are a whole bunch of different options. Now, of course you could go and just run everything from a command line, but it's also just kind of nice to have everything managed in a GUI, especially if you have an application that you want to share with others on your team and they may not really feel super excited about going into a CLI to go run stuff. So I would just say run open web UI, or at least for this tutorial, that's what we're gonna do. Now, when you're on the GitHub page, if you scroll down a little bit past the initial instructions, you'll see that there is a bundle with open web UI plus Olama. Now that is the one that we want here. It's super easy if you have Docker installed. Now, if you don't have Docker installed or haven't installed Docker at this point, I, I don't really know how to help you other than there is everything that you need in terms of documentations with a quick search. And there's also a convenience script that you can use just to get things running nice and fast. Now, of course, your business may have different security things, but we are going to just say, hey, let's do a easy Docker installation. And then we're going to go and make this work super fast. And if you look, there is one that is specifically for a CPU only, which is exactly what we're doing here. So you can copy and paste that command and you should be able to see the packages pull and everything gets set up. Life is great now. You can set up your default user and then you can get into the web UI. Now at this point, you're probably totally jazzed. Like I'm gonna go run everything, but there's another step that you need to do. And that is to go and download the models that you wanna use. And we're gonna use DeepSeek R1, but if you were to go to the Olama page where you can find all the models that you might wanna go download for this example, one thing that you're gonna notice is that the default 671B is not actually the full fat FP16 version. Instead, it's a distilled version. Now using those distilled models can get you better performance, but the the goal of this is to actually go all the way up to do the FP16 version of the DeepSeek R1 model. And so, well, that's the one we're gonna download. You'll notice that the model size is 1.3 terabytes, but that shouldn't scare you because we have a virtualization server with one and a half terabytes. So we're just gonna copy the model name and then we're gonna go back into our open web UI. We're gonna go to our administrative panel and we're gonna go click models. And then we're gonna go in and we're gonna just paste that there and then hit download. Now it's gonna take a little bit for it to download. And once it does, we're set. And by the way, we have tested a bunch of different models. So we're really showing you the high-end version of this. Again, there are other smaller models, especially if you have like a smaller server, that might be something that you wanna look at or if you wanna run a bunch of models concurrently. And once that's 100% downloaded, all you have to do is select the model that you want to use. So in this case, we want to go and do our 671 BFP16 model. We select that and then we are prompted and we can just go put in our prompt. And here we're just going to say you're an expert in cloud infrastructure. What is the typical ratio of memory in gigabytes to core in cloud servers? Just because we wanted to know what that is. The response actually, by the way, was pretty good. And we'll talk about performance in a second, but I want to talk about how you
how you can make this even easier to run. Now we're using KVM virtual machines here. And of course in a VM, you are gonna get lower performance. We'll talk a little bit about that in our performance section. But the other thing to remember is that if you do have a virtualization cluster, a lot of folks have things like ESXi or Windows Server or something like that. And so if you do have a virtualization cluster, a good idea is frankly to just put this in a VM and make your life super easy. And of course, if you have something like Kubernetes cluster or Docker host or something that you can just run containers on, then your life is actually a little bit easier because you already have the container infrastructure in place. With that, let's talk a little bit about the performance we saw even with that high-end model. Okay, so talking about performance real quick, this is not the fastest that you're ever gonna see. Let's be very clear on that, but we're really just trying to get to the point that we can run the full DeepSeq R1 FP16 model. Now, just using the default settings, we're getting somewhere in that little over one token per second range. It wasn't quite two, but on the other hand, it wasn't necessarily terrible. And before we get too far in this, I wanna point out a couple things. Like first, there are a lot of knobs you can turn. And number two, uh, CPU optimization, frankly, is not great on these LLMs at this point. That that is an area that I think there are folks that are gonna do a lot of work over the next couple months and these things will get a lot faster and probably make this a lot more usable. So one thing that I did was just, hey, let's go play with some of the sliders. And we just went and said, hey, what happens if we go all the way up and increase our batch size to 1024 and then also increase our threads up to 256? I mean, hey, we have a giant server, so why don't we just try that? And when we did, we were getting in about 1.8, I think is the one that we recorded, but our average was closer to just over 1.9 tokens per second. So we're getting pretty darn close to two here. And that is frankly pretty usable. The other thing though, that we saw when we did this was that our CPU utilization was nowhere near 100%. In fact, it was actually lower than 40%. And when we looked at our memory utilization, we saw that we were just under 1.3 terabytes used, which means that we had more memory in our system. So something that I mentioned earlier is the fact that you can go and run these models while running additional virtual machines, which is something that I don't know if I really expected when we started this project, but it turned out that especially if you have something that you have a server where you're running a very low utilization, like 10, 20%, somewhere in there, you can definitely run virtual machines alongside these large AI models. So when we ran it in a KVM virtual machine, we were seeing somewhere in that three to 6% lower uh, performance range. So not necessarily a huge, huge delta, especially if you're getting the advantage of being able to run this in a virtual machine alongside other applications. Okay, now to do this, uh, we had to kind of find a way to do workloads that we could actually go and push and just kind of do some kind of profiling. I mean, like if you are running a giant AI model on the machine and you wanna run something else, then I, I don't, you know, all these applications that folks run are always gonna be different, right? There's different loads on them, different SLAs and stuff. And so what I thought was, why don't we just go run a couple of just VMs we had. And the idea was, I just wanted to see the impact of running a reasoning model on the same system that we were running other VMs. Now, if a VM is using a ton of compute memory and especially memory bandwidth, like if you're trying to run an HPC application alongside this, that is the wrong idea, folks. But on the other hand, there are a lot of folks that have very simple VMs. I mean, there are folks that have VMs that are running work group applications where there are a few people using it during the day, but you know, your SLA doesn't necessarily have to be the best. If you took another 10 milliseconds to give a response, probably nobody's gonna notice. Now, when we ran a file server VM, we certainly noticed some throughput difference. So something to just watch out for if you're doing a lot of throughput on a VM, um, that may not be the right answer for running a long Inside a giant AI model, but you can still do it. We also ran our little RAID reliability calculator that's on the main site, just kind of ran that on there and uh, put some load on that. And frankly, we didn't really see that much of a difference, right? So I, I think the, the big story here is if you are going to run VMs alongside this, I would go through your VM list and like what you have in your cluster and kind of cherry pick the ones that aren't really too rough where you just kind of need them running, but they're not really using a ton of resources. And I know there are folks saying like, oh, my, my servers are all 80% utilized. And frankly, most folks don't have that. And there are always VMs that, you know, run at a lower utilization level. But I think the big thing here is that if you want to go and do a little bit of VM shuffle and you got this virtual machine host running something like, you know, 
not a, not a ton of memory, but also running less than 20% utilization on the CPUs, then it's something that you can run alongside this giant DeepSeek model. And so you get the benefit of still running those applications while also getting the benefit of running a giant model. I mean, that is a huge capability that not a lot of folks talk about. But since we are using a dual socket server, there's another aspect to performance that we need to get into. So let's get to that next. Okay, now going back to our server, there is an important piece of context that if you screw up, it's gonna go sideways real fast on this. And what that is, is what's called NUMA domains. Um, there are different ways that you can set up NUMA domains, especially on new CPUs where you have tons of cores. Now, NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access. And what that basically means is that if you have memory and you have a core and you are trying to move data between them, sometimes the memory takes a little bit longer to get to, so you may have different latency. Now in HPC applications, these guys will go out and put like four NUMA domains on a single processor, maybe three or something like that, just to go and most tightly couple the CPU cores to their memory or their DIMMs that are attached. But in virtualization servers, that's actually uh, much less common. Usually you'll just see one NUMA domain across an entire chip. And so the entire chip, you know, looks like it can access all the memory. That's important because there's the other side of a dual socket server, which is frankly the other chip. So between the two CPUs, there is an interconnect. AMD calls this Infinity Fabric, and you would hear something like UPI or something on the Intel side. But the important thing is that is much slower than all of the interconnect that you would have on a package. And also, uh, from a latency standpoint, you have more latency because instead of just being on a CPU package, you're going off the chip through the motherboard and then to the other chip and then through that chip to the memory sockets that are attached. So it just takes forever on a relative scale uh, to go between one sockets and you know the other sockets memory, right? But the reason that's super important is what happens if you screw up that understanding when you're doing AI inference on a CPU. By accident, uh, I set up NUMA control to set this up and, uh, and actually use the memory from one CPU with the cores from the other CPU and we were talking our performance decreased by like a factor of 10. I know that seems really simple to a lot of folks, but if we're talking about the case where you're using one of the CPUs really to go run your virtualization workloads because maybe you normally are at like 30% or so CPU utilization and using the other CPU really for your AI inference application, that could be one that as you're pushing your workloads to one socket or another, if you screw that up, you're gonna see really, really poor performance. Okay, so with all of our videos, I like to have key lessons learned. And what do we learn here? Well, I think there are a couple things. One, you have a lot of opportunity if you have extra virtualization capacity on your CPU servers to go and run large models. That's not necessarily to say that they're gonna run the fastest. I mean, of course, if you're gonna go spend money and build a AI-centric infrastructure, you know, there are real servers these days that are designed specifically to run AI. But frankly, those things are in high demand right now and uh, they're pretty costly. You also, a lot of folks have these virtualization clusters, Kubernetes clusters, just general Linux servers, all kinds of servers that are out there that are being underutilized. I mean, we hear stories on STH all the time of folks that have servers that are running at 30% utilization. Some folks have servers that, you know, frankly run at much under, they're well under 10% utilization on a daily basis. Now, of course, a lot of cloud providers are able to go get up into that 70% utilization range, but it's not uncommon at all for businesses and enterprises to be well below that. Personally, I think this is an awesome opportunity. So long as you're making sure that you're efficiently using your memory bandwidth and you're not trying to do uh, socket to socket links because so you don't want to do that. There's opportunity to go run these large models, but also smaller models at very usable rates. Even the larger models are really usable if you don't think of them as I have to sit there and, you know, see what's going on and like, you know, everything has to be real time. And you think of it more as like, I'm gonna go task this model with doing something and just kind of evaluate how well that model comes back and, you know, is is it is the response usable, right? Because what a lot of folks are trying to do today is figure out how do they integrate AI into their current workflows. And it's pretty hard to know, like if a reasoning model is gonna be useful for you if you can't even run the reasoning model, right? So on the CPU, at least you have enough memory that while it may not be fast, it'll at least let you start evaluating what the results could be. 
And for other folks, there's another really useful usage model, right? That's just, hey, I'm gonna go and give the system a couple tasks and then I'm gonna go walk away for a sec. The other thing that's nice is that if you have a large virtualization cluster and you wanna use smaller models, especially something that's like 70B and below, I mean, those things run decently well on a virtualization host and you can run a couple of them across different hosts without that much of an impact. And the final and most important thing is that just frankly, there isn't as much optimization going on on the CPU side as there is on the GPU side. People are spending tons of money to optimize AI workloads on GPUs because those are really are the you know systems that are designed to run those workloads. But on the other hand, when you do get speed ups due to those optimizations on the CPU, they tend to be pretty useful. I'd love to hear what you guys think. And if you actually do go and deploy this, let me know down in the comments. And hey, if you did like this video, you wanna share it with your friends, colleagues, go get a project kicked off, all that kind of stuff, go share this thing widely. But the other thing is also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching, have an awesome day.